I'm Vita Jamu, Managing Director of DEI Programs and Community Engagement here at the National Civil Rights Museum. Noted as one of the nation's premier heritage and cultural museums, the National Civil Rights Museum is that fast in its mission to share the culture and lessons from the American Civil Rights Movement and explore how this significant era continues to shape equality and freedom globally. As we examine the evolution of law enforcement here in the United States, we collectively seek solutions to address America's broken policing practices and reimagine what public safety should look like within our communities. The reckoning, the resolve, the restoration, and the resilience is a four-part national convening that the National Civil Rights Museum designed to bring together thought leaders, policy makers, surviving families, and activists to examine the historical connections of systemic racial balance and find solutions to address the injustices that have plagued our communities. In March, we gathered for the first convening, the reckoning, community policing and accountability to pursue justice for victims like Tyree Nichols with actionable steps to stop police violence that has terrorized our communities. In June, we held a second convening, the resolve, eliminating systemic racism and toxic cultures to explore how structural racism has influenced toxic cultures that negativity negatively impacted law enforcement and produced bias-based police strategies. So I would like to just recognize and acknowledge all that have been impacted by police violence. We have many here with us tonight, so thank you all for joining us for this critical conversation. Now, I would like to turn it over to the president of the National Civil Rights Museum, Dr. Russell Wigginton. Thank you, Vita. And thank you all for attending this evening. We're honored to have you in our hallowed grounds, on our hallowed grounds. Tonight's conversation, the restoration, community healing for solutions to police violence, is the third gathering of our series of national convenings. Our panel of experts will discuss opportunities for collective healing among victims of police brutality, law enforcement, and the communities they serve, as well as collaborative trauma-informed interventions that reduce police violence and improve community police relations. It is now my honor to welcome the panel to come to the stage. The moderator for this evening is Reverend Earl J. Fisher. He is a movement and ministerial leader and, the, and a soul-stirring scholar at the vanguard of social justice and black liberation efforts in Memphis and beyond. In 2018, Reverend Fisher earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Communication from the University of Memphis and is currently serving as senior pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Memphis, affectionately referred to as the blackest church in Shelby County. <laughs> as a community 
organizer, Dr. Fisher, co-organized the Memphis Grassroots Organization Coalition in August of 2015 in response to the brutal, brutal death of Darius Stewart by a Memphis police officer. Spearheading initiatives in criminal justice reform, media accountability, and the removal of federal, of Confederate uh, monuments and voter empowerment. Dr. Fisher formed Up the Vote 901 in 2017 to quote, give more political power to more people, end quote, and to increase voter turnout in Memphis and Shelby County in every election. Dr. Fisher teaches religion and humanities at, at several colleges and universities and is a 2021 inductee in the Martin Luther King College of Ministers and laity board of preachers at Morehouse College. He is a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha, husband of one wife, Denise, father of one son, Jalen, believer in one God, and a friend and mentor to many. I am delighted to call him one of my friends. Please join me in acknowledging and recognizing our moderator, Earl Fisher. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to my dear brother Russ and Sister Tamika, to the entirety of the National Civil Rights Museum staff. I would take time to name all of you, but I don't want to leave anybody out. But can we give it up for the whole National Civil Rights Museum? I also want to make sure I echo the sentiments that have been shared regarding the families and those who have been most directly impacted by police violence. We honor and affirm your humanity and uh, we send you our love. Also to the community that is gathered in this space, we thank you for taking some time to engage in this conversation, as well as those who are watching via YouTube. So we will try to entertain some questions. I'll be trying to follow along on the YouTube live chat. So if you are here in the audience, and you want to try to provide something for us to pitch to the panelists, please try to provide it via the live chat on YouTube. Let me briefly introduce each panelist and then we'll allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves and have some preliminary conversation. First, can we give a round of applause to the director of the Shelby County Health Department, Dr. Michelle Taylor. To her left is the psychiatrist and self-care expert. Give it up for Dr. Janet Taylor. <laughs> to my left is the Senior Vice President of Policy and Community Engagement at the Center for Policing Equity at New York City. Give it up for Eric Cumberbatch. <laughs> to his left, clinical psychologist and author Dr. Ellen Kirschman. And last but most certainly not least, the former Baltimore Police Department chief and head of the communication, the partnership, and the founder of LOVE, Chief Melvin T. Russell. So I want us to enter this by you know, acknowledging our entry points or showing our hand. This would be the first part of like three different moves in this conversation. So I would like for everybody, and I'll start with home team, Dr. Michelle Taylor. I want everybody to kind of say where people can find out more about your exhaustive bio and some of your background. And then say a little bit about the work that you do regarding community healing, especially with respect to police violence. And what is it that really fuels your fire and your passion for this work? And try to do it in two minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, and I get to go first. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's so good to see all of you. I know a lot of you all in the audience. I'm Dr. Michelle Taylor. I'm the director of the Shelby County Health Department, and I'll get straight to what fuels my passion because you can find my bio on shelbytnhealth.com, and most of the people in here who are from Memphis probably already know it chapter and verse. We won't talk about why, though. So um, I would say that what fuels my passion for this work is equity. 
Um, we had the opportunity to do a tour together today. And even though I've been in this space so many times because I'm a native Memphian, this was the first time I had done a guided tour. And it left me so full because my parents used to bring me and my brother here way before it was ever a museum. And so what fuels my passion for this work is the legacy that they and my grandparents and my great grandparents gave me. When Dr. King was assassinated, both my parents were in middle school. And so when they would bring us here, they would tell us the story of what that night was like and what that time was like and what it felt like and what it, what it meant to be a Memphian and what it meant to be an American, frankly, and what it meant to be African-American in this space. So what fuels my passion is making sure that we have equity. We hear a lot about equality because that's really what the civil rights movement has been about thus far. But we're transitioning to what I believe is a need for more equity. Equality is giving everybody the same thing. Equity is giving everybody what they need what they need. And unfortunately, what we're seeing right now, there are a lot of people wanting to close their ears about what's really needed. So what does equity look like? It looks like the supports that my children have that have been built over generations, over generations, are the same supports or additional supports that other children I know need in this community are given, are given freely, are supported across the board, across the political spectrum, and they are done because we want everybody to have an equitable chance, not an equal chance, an equitable chance of living a thriving, healthy, and productive life. That's what fuels my passion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll echo what Dr. Taylor said about just being here. And every time I come to the National Civil Rights Museum, I'm, I'm just filled with the spirit of the folks who died and also the legacy of those coming on. And a special acknowledgement to the families being here. Your courage does not go unnoticed, and neither does your trauma. Um, I have a website, drjanettaylor.com, if you want to read more about me. But this is not about me. It's about all of you. And really what fuels my passion for what I do is the recognition that um, our brain is our biggest ally during this time. It can help us as we make decisions. It can help us as we work through our grief. It can help us as we dive into the strengths that are inherent in our DNA that gets lost by trauma, gets lost by social injustice, which gets lost and, and dampened every time we um, or either the direct victim of police violence, but also understanding that witnessing it either indirectly, you know, on YouTube, on TV, causes damage to especially black and brown communities. And so for me, I live in Sarasota, Florida now, where I run a clinic, a MAC clinic for people addicted to opiates and alcohol, but spent 25 years in New York working at Harlem Hospital, working at Rikers, working at people who my whole career has pretty much been under-resourced communities, and specifically where there were black and brown people. So I think we have to reframe um, mental health, not just mental health is not just mental illness. You know, often when we feel something like the result of seeing police violence or the result of trauma, you might have post-traumatic stress disorder, you may have anxiety or depression, and that shouldn't label you. So we have to lose the stigma and understand that when we're talking about mental health, we are also talking about mental wellness and the prevention, and getting back to what Eric said about reframing police, policing as public safety, we also have to really search for doctors and healthcare providers that do not continue to label us, that can see our pain but not pathologize it, which has been done historically. We know there's a long history of racism and bias in medicine. So my passion is every single person that I come across, I help them find their strengths. And we can do that in the first five minutes that we see them. And it's really about understanding that life is stressful, 
but the strength that we have, the power that we have individually, the power that we have collectively, and if you do have a mental illness, the power that you have to get treatment is there. So just finding the strength, finding the positivity in every single person I come across is what fuels my passion. I think everything you said, you took it away, but I, I would just add to it and give, I'm passionate because I recognize and realize that I am my ancestor's dream. And that's why I'm here. And when I look into an audience like this, I see myself. I see myself reflected. I see the same experiences that people have endured generation after generation after generation. I've been in spaces like this since I was a child with my great grandparents, my grandparents, my parents, uncles, aunts, and others who have these same discussions generation after generation. So my passion is I know we have the brilliance, the wisdom, the resiliency to create change. As a black man in America, I don't think there is an origin story for me to enter into this space. It's not something that propelled me to become passionate about doing this. This is who I am. I tell my son, I was born in war. This is who I am. I'm born in war. So I have two choices. Either I'm going to fight or I'm going to lay down. And I'm not laying down. And what that fight looks like is very different on multiple levels. And for me, I chose this level. I chose the level of empowering people that look like me, empowering people that come from the same communities as me, and lifting us up into spaces where we're actually seeking legislative reform. We're actually creating the change that we want to see. We're no longer asking people to do something for us, but we're the doers. We put ourselves in positions of power, and we create the change that we want to see. Those brothers and sisters that are, are closest to, to the issues that we're talking about tonight, those are the leaders. Those are the people we need to empower and put in positions to make change. And that's why I'm here. So thank you all. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I flew in here from uh, California. I live near San Francisco. Uh, never been to Memphis. Never saw the Mississippi. So this is a, uh, a really unique experience and an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm hoping to make a contribution, but I'm a little bit intimidated by the, the contributions I've already heard from uh, those that have spoken before me. Um, you can find out more about me, more than you'll ever want to know, probably uh, on uh, www.ellenkirschman.com. I've been counseling police officers and their families for 40 plus years before I had any gray hair at all. <laughs> and we, we say to them what you said, Dr. Taylor, it's not post-traumatic stress disorder, it's an injury. And we know we can recover from an injury. When, uh, when you ask the question, what fuels my passion? That really stopped me in my tracks because after 40 years, I sort of don't remember. So I started to think about it a lot. And you know, I can, here's my answer. What fuels my passion is I hate suffering. I think I got into police work because I love stories. I also write fiction. And there's plenty of stories in law enforcement. That's how everything is transmitted. That's how, how education, and intergenerational drama within the police. It's all uh, transmitted by war stories. But then when I actually started working with police, I saw a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. I saw what the wear and tear of the job does to the human being who puts on the badge. I saw what it does to their families. And I saw what it does to the community that they serve. So I've kept working all these years and I think you ask me, have I made any changes? Um, you know how you move that needle just a wee little bit. So I'm here to say that because of the work that some of my colleagues and I have done, police families are no longer invisible. We understand that cops are human beings. 
We understand that they get traumatized by what they do, and we understand that there is really not the right fit yet. We'd have a police force. What we want is a police service. What we want is more, you mentioned that, the guardian mentality rather than the enforcement mentality. I'm sad to say that's a hard sell for most cops. But I'm, I'm honored to be here with people that are working as hard as you all are working uh, to make that happen. And I think that if we have healthier police officers, mentally healthier, they're not sleep deprived, they're not in the middle of a, a horrible family uh, divorce, uh, that they will be better able to serve and they will recognize their own humanity because you got to recognize yours first before you can recognize it in anyone else. So I'm looking at my watch because I want to do it just as well as my panelists in that two minutes there. <laughs> so um, I am honored and I am humbled to be here amongst this great cloud of witnesses, all of you, um, this incredible esteemed panelists. As I look out, I know that Probably everyone sitting in that audience, including us up here, have been at some level traumatized by policing, whether it's a family member, or you personally, and some of you deeply impacted by police trauma. If you want to find out more about me, I'm Melvin Russell. Melvin Russell, just Google Melvin Russell, Baltimore. If you want to add police on it, probably more than enough is going to pop up that you're going to find out about me, including my bio. My passion is... Listen, there was a president that wrote, and we, I was reminded of it today. Thomas Jefferson penned, all men are created equal. And I got to believe that was just inspired by something greater than him to do that, because certainly he didn't embody that. But at the same time, I believe in that, that we all have been created equal. And by me being in law enforcement for almost 40 years, I like to say 40 years because it was 39 years, 233 days, and 16 hours. I'm not sure of the minutes, so I'm closer to 40 than 30. So anyway, and with that said, I know during my career, I was both a guardian and a warrior. The guardian was never supported. Servicing, protecting, loving on communities and even fellow officers was never supported. It was considered soft policing. That's why we have this mantra, protect and serve. But I look around the country today and a lot of them have only saved protect on their cars. They have dropped the service piece mm. and policing has gotten broken and out of balance. And I felt like there's so many of our ancestors who have gone before us as champions and martyrs, including on this holy ground where we are today, that who am I to have been blessed enough, poor little black boy from Baltimore, to be getting to an institution that was kind of OK when I started and watch it crumble and the culture just absolutely get unbalanced to where it was just horrific where they just did protection protection to protection which meant over policing over policing and mostly in neighborhoods that look like mine so my passion has always tried to get the balance back greater than it's ever been i want to see law enforcement reformed i don't want to see it defunded but i know law enforcement inside out and i know most of them have these inflated budgets and simply if they can carve something out and work in collaboration with communities the people that are doing the real work that we can change policing in America because this thing that's happening now and that has been happening for dec decades is an ugly thing that absolutely gets my goat. So for the last years, my past has been the same reforming police. So I'm working with people on a national level all over the country and I'm going to do it until the day I die unless God allows me to see it. And then you'll see me first world news congratulating all the communities across this country and the police that finally got it right because we got to get this right no more tyree nichols god bless you so thank all of you for that and we affirm your passion i think where you ended off chief russell is where i want us to do a little bit more of this entry point some of this was like entry points personally let's talk about entry points more collectively let's show our hands a little bit more so you talked about policing getting broken or has gotten broken i'm curious so is there anybody amongst us who would dispute the claim that policing in america as an institution 
we even heard in the video, uh, one of the activists in Memphis, Amber Sherman, talk about this, is rooted in slave patrol. So it, 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 does anybody object to that concrete reality? If that's true, if it is rooted in slave patrols, is it even possible to heal our communities from the impact of policing without addressing and changing the system and the structure of policing at its core? I, I'm curious where you enter that, um, Chief Russell, Eric, I'm, I'm curious about where you enter that too. That's definitely for anybody. Is it even possible to do it? Is reform possible? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But it's an uphill battle. Listen, no one here is gonna dispute that policing in America didn't get its roots in slave patrol. Listen, in the beginning, we know that these Southern colonies of America, that's what they did. They were basically going after runaway slaves and bringing them back to their masters and it was horrible, horrific time. And at the same time, I want to point out, though, our northern, northern colonies, they were more doing it better. These were volunteers. Maybe some of them were paid and they were basically looking out for each other colonists and making sure there wasn't any prostitution and gambling, because that's about as rough as it got back then. But over time, finally, the United States. So we moved from 1600s up until now over the United States, finally, the 1800s, started to look at somebody across the across the seas, Sir Robert Poole. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may not. But he, he got it right. He said, you know what? Community is policing and policing is community. We are wanting to say some of us are just put in positions to protect the rest of us. And he had it right. And so we started off doing this thing right, but somehow it slipped away from us. And so now it's this ugly thing where eagles got in the way, corruption got in the way, power, everything happened wrong, especially when you start seeing people that look like us that are now... Listen, they came up, like I heard Eric said, I was born in this war. I was born in this war. But all of a sudden, you go into a culture and an institution that somehow has so much authority and power, if you're going to succeed in it, that it drags you in and you forget about who you really are. You become one of the culture people and you forget, you forget the skin that you're in. So many people in policing, they skin folk, but they ain't kin folk. They look like us but they don't act like us. And so I'm telling you, I was one of few in abolition that many, that many people looked at me and said, you're not doing it right, but I fought. And I never forgot what my mother and my father and my grandparents taught me. We can do this the right way. And so, yeah, I got laughed at. Yeah, I got lied on. Yeah, I got stuff planted on me. A lot of things happened, but I was determined to get reforming and policing. It can get right if you put the right leadership in. Here's one of the most horrific things that happened in policing in this country, the reason why we have what we have. Because you keep putting in good old boys, whether they're black or white, into a system that will go along to get along and fatten their pockets. If you ever get to a point, if you ever get to a point like maybe sheriff departments and vote, community vote in their top cops. Because if they don't have a relationship with the, with the people in the community, if they don't have a relational equity, you can't come from another state and then come into my city and be a police if we don't know you. But I will vote for somebody that I knew them since they were officer friendly, that I know who know how to act with the kids. They're not abusive. They love on us. That's who I want to see rise up through the rank, and that's the person I'm going to vote for top cop. But you always get these guys cookie molded, cutting out of a cookie cutter, and they take over the job, don't care nothing about us as a people and as a city. Some who even was raised in that city, but the culture got them and they helped destroy the fabric of our city. Stop putting the wrong leadership in place. People with power are the people in the community and we will not raise up our voices. And if we do it, we do it long we enough do. that they outweigh us. Chief Russell. I'm sorry, because you messing me up, man, with this topic, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to you again. I appreciate the passion again. And you put a lot out there, mm -hmm. right? Um, Eric, I'm trying to direct this to you yeah, to with, with this kind of like... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good on it. You good? I, I, I get it. <laughs> you know, and I, I think this is a lens that I bring to the panel, which is I could respectfully disagree. And when I say I respectfully disagree is that we, I find it nearly impossible, if not impossible, to reform an institution that is doing exactly what it was built to do. Mm -hmm. So the things that we're talking about, you can't reform your way out of a white supremacist culture, a white supremacist institution, and you're the target by skin color. 
You can't reform your way out of that. And who's in power, leadership, those things, that's an individual. There's a system, an institutional system that's in place that does exactly what it's intended to do and has been doing this just like when I opened up and I said I've had these conversations very intentional with my great grandmother. My great grandmother, she lived to be over 108 years old. The same pain that we have in this room today is the same pain that she had in the kitchen while having this conversation. So I, we can't reform. I believe what we can do as black people with brilliance and genius and wisdom of those types of experiences of that legacy that's passed on is what do we rebuild? What do we reimagine? Why are we even having a conversation talking about what can law enforcement, what can police be? Why do we have that as a system that is supposed to balance and govern our lives? Why, why does this system exist? What is the response? What, is the, what are the, the proactive measures and means that we can be undertaking so that there is no engagement with law enforcement? And I'm not an abolitionist. I believe there is a role for police. But when you have police that are involved in every segment of your life, whether it's traffic, whether it's sexual or, 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 or gender affirming care and rights, whether it's education, whether it's immigration, every aspect in your life, the response from government, the option that government has given you is police. If you walk out this door right now and have a, a mental health episode, it's police. So when do we democratize public safety? And that's the real thing that has to happen. When do we democratize public safety and ex expound and expand the definition that police do not own public safety and that there are several institutions that exist that are just as powerful in creating healthy outcomes, better outcomes, and stopping the killing of us. We have to get to that space of being bold and radical. And if we're not willing to be bold and radical, then we're going to just create the same system over and over again, a system that is doing what it's been intended to do. So, so Eric, I think you're talking about what I want the second phase of this conversation to be about, which is assessing the impact of policing. So first we showed our hands, so now let's share our hearts. And I think Dr. Dana Taylor, you were just about to jump in. I want to pitch this to you this way. You heard Eric talk about the experiences of his grandmother and how it seems as though we're in a perpetual state of trauma. And so what has the proliferation, you mentioned some of this in your opening remarks too. So the proliferation of police involved shootings, especially it being looped over in the media over and over again. What has it done to the mental health of our community and what is it doing to police and civilian relations? Or how do we manage or mitigate that trauma? So in our communities, um, police violence, trauma is literally destroying the mental health of our young girls because often young girls and women are left out of this conversation. Um, and at higher rates, um, it makes you know, young girls a lot of times will internalize and may get depressed and anxious instead of acting out as, as some young men will do, but they still are as traumatized. Dr. David Williams from Harvard has done, among others, has done a lot of studies that shows that in a community, when a black unarmed man or woman or brown unarmed man or woman is killed, that the number of days that people have to take off of work because of stress and anxiety is increased, um, depression, um, feeling helpless, feeling hopeless, and the whites who are in that same community are unaffected. So there's no question we know when you look at mortality rates of black people being lower and the impact of the stress of racism and, and weathering, that it has a significant impact. And so what I was struck by with what Eric was talking about is the fact that if we're really going to do something dramatic, I agree, reform is not possible, we have to blow it up. Why do we have to police with guns? Why do we have to police with guns? Because whether you're a black officer or a brown officer or a white officer, to the brain, black skin is a weapon. That's right. And we know that. 
we know it's a weapon. And so, and that's across the board. So I've lived in Canada, where when I moved to Vancouver, Canada, there were two murders that year. My daughter recently moved to London, where the police officers don't carry guns at all, unless they have to go in for something, you know, some SWAT terrorist thing. Why do police officers need guns? 70% of people who are incarcerated are in for nonviolent offenses. And, and even higher rates, if you look at jails and prisons, people have mental illness. So I think if we're going to talk about rebuilding, then we have to look at that. And, and I know that there are ways to um, de-escalate situations. I know that there are ways to stop somebody from a, with a traffic stop or if you have to police them that don't involve a weapon, and we don't need it. So I, I think, I mean, I have a lot of respect for police officers. Um, no disrespect there, but I think if we're going to do something totally different and radical, then we need to look at how we keep public safety in a way that does not endanger black men and brown men and women. And as long as our skin is black, we're endangered. So to counter that, and since we're talking about a restoration, it's not, I don't want anyone in here to walk out feeling worse, but there is a reality. And the restoration comes from within. And, you know, as a psychiatrist, I'm limited. I'm not a pastor. Um, and I'm limited in what I can cer certainly preach about how we need to feel about ourselves. But our suffering, um, there's always an option to suffering, no matter how bad you feel. And so it is about being able to um, realize how you got over, how you made it through, even getting here tonight, those little things that we really need to do to focus on our mental health and self-care, especially during these times. It's about connection, understanding you're not alone. And that is, and love, which I think is the biggest counterbalance to everything happening in, in our communities. So look around. And those times you feel isolated, you think about every single person here who came to hear this panel, who's been to the other sessions, who cares about you. And if you need help with your mental health, get it. Dr. Taylor, I'm sure, can talk about resources. Vita passed out a sheet about resources, but taking care of ourselves mentally is, is so critical during this time. So, so mm -hmm. Dr. Michelle Taylor, I'm coming to you, but I want to say, number one, as a matter of housekeeping, somebody's going to have to fix the timer in the front because... I don't know how much time we have left, and I can talk. There's a lot that's on the table, and I know we don't have all night, but I do. I want to push this a little bit. I don't want us to pitch something that feels overly idealistic or naive or utopian. Uh, part of the reason officers have guns is because there's a plethora of guns around. This ain't Canada. This ain't London. Right, right, and I want us to follow up on some right. of the nuances, right? Like, I because I definitely, definitely agree that we need to find alternative ways of policing, especially that's much more sensitive to the mental health piece. Dr. Michelle Taylor, what I think you can help us with is people talk about violence and gun violence in particular as a public health crisis, and so clearly there are some things that we can do from a public policy standpoint, maybe Absolutely. in terms of our approach to it. And I want to know, like, how how do we factor in police violence within this framework? Because when people talk about gun violence, they don't tend to center or at least account for the police violence and the traumatic impact that Dr. Janet Taylor talked about. So can you share some insights insofar as that? Absolutely. Instance? So, um the people in the crowd who have heard me talk before, they know that I rarely use the term gun violence when I'm talking about violence in Memphis, Tennessee and Shelby County. I usually say community violence because there are all forms of violence and that includes police violence, unfortunately. And so um, my first disciplinary love is pediatrics. So I was a pediatrician first in my career. And I often remind people that um, before somebody was holding a gun, whether they're a police officer or on the other end of a gun and they're not a police officer, um, they were a child. And they had all kinds of experiences that affected them. The discipline of epigenetics means how does the social get under your skin? And we know uh, that epigenetics can change the way 
your genes are expressed. Don't want to get too scientific, but what does that mean in layman's terms? It means that if you are exposed to too much violence in any of its forms, once or a hundred times, it can change the way you learn, it can change the way you think, it can change the way you react to a certain situation. And if you've got two people there, a police officer who is afraid of the skin color of the person, and the person who is scared of this police officer because of police violence that they've either witnessed themselves or heard about from generations of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, especially living in this community, then that affects what's going to happen in that situation. So when I sat down with my team to get ready for this panel, we went back and forth. We had a great discussion. And one of the ways I was able to explain it was this. Um, we talked about the reaction of a black adolescent here in Shelby County versus a white adolescent in regards to what our whole community has been feeling since the murder of Tyree Nichols. And we know that toxic stress really is driven by a chemical in our body called cortisol. And the way that I explained it to my team was this. If you took 10 black adolescents, 10 white adolescents, all from Shelby County, who all know about Mr. Tyree Nichols and what happened to him, and you hook them up and you tested their blood for their cortisol levels, I can guarantee you that the African-American kids would have high cortisol levels as soon as you said his name. And more than likely, the white children probably would not have levels as high. They may have high levels, but it wouldn't be as high as those black children. Why is that? Because when we are born, we are already affected by the things that have happened to the people who brought us into this world. As a pediatrician, I used to round at the hospital and all the babies, you know, you go to the nursery, all the babies are lined up, right? And they're all in the bassinets. They all look the same, right? Maybe a little variation in skin color. You got to check the ears, right? See what color they're going to be. <laughs> little variation. Yeah. But as a pediatrician, even then I knew that I could tell the difference when I went to their chart and I saw where their parents were going to take them home to. I already had an inkling of what kind of experiences they were gonna have just based on the neighborhood they were going to. I already knew that life expectancy, which we predict at birth, not when you get halfway through, at birth, when you're in that bassinet, as public health professionals, we predicted at birth, life expectancy is different by at least nine years between African-Americans and white folks here in Shelby County. And in some neighborhoods, the difference is 20 years. 20 years. What else do we know? When you look at the maps, we know that if you look at a map of 1930s redlining here in Shelby County, life expectancy by birth right now, any other health outcome you want to put in there, put COVID in there, put heart disease in there, put cancer in there, put any number of things on that map, it's going to look just like that redlining map. Same. So if we know that, if we know that, if we intrinsically know that, if we can see it, because a lot of us need to see the evidence, right? If we know that, we know that what Eric is saying is right. We have to blow up some of these systems to even begin to change what some of those maps look like. The reform is just not going to work. You got to blow it up. But you also have to realize that in trying to blow it up, you got to be strategic. You got to be ready for the type of barriers you're going to get. And sometimes the barriers are going to be from the folks that you really are 
trying to do the most benefit for, to make it a more equitable place, right? But does that mean we stop doing it? No. But really, the public health approach, just getting so back stop, to that. Stop doing what? Does it mean we stop doing? Do we stop trying to blow up the system? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, trying to make sure that we're doing that next step pass reform. Uh -huh. Trying to make sure that you don't walk into the health department and you're able to get Dr. King's <laughs> death certificate, yeah. but you can't get Elvis Presley's my, my. because the state embargoed yeah. Elvis Presley's right after his death. And they've never embargoed Dr. King's death certificate. I, I think you are angling the comprehensive nature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what it's going to take to get us to the places in our communities whereby we can actually see some of the public health and social determinants of health improve. It's not just going to be with one you know, election cycle or no. one policy here or there. Mm -hmm. I, so maybe I'm going to talk to the Civil Rights Museum. Y'all don't tell them I said this. But maybe this shouldn't be the restoration. Maybe this should be the revolution or the rebirth or something. Because Absolutely. it doesn't seem, and I'm coming to you, Dr. Ellen Kirschman, it, it doesn't seem as if we have ever had anything that has been holistic or healthy or complete enough to restore. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're saying it is at its core rotten, rotten or at the very least contaminated, diseased, mm -hmm. and in need of you know, in my faith tradition, we would say exorcism, right? Oh, definitely in need of something. But to add another wrinkle to this, Dr. Ellen Kirschman, um, in some of what I reviewed, and I think they showed a segment of an um, interview that you were doing that I, I observed as well, and I thought it was fascinating because you describe policing as have, having not just a negative impact on those who are policed, but a negative impact on the police themselves, and, and even their family, it makes me think about when Dr. King was in the Birmingham jail and he said to the bailiff or somebody, he was like, hey, how much you make? And then he told him, he said, man, you need to be out here marching with us. Right. And so can you say a little bit more about the negative psychological impact that policing has on the officers? And if there are approaches to policing itself, as we start to try to revision whatever this policing or public safety apparatus could be, that could have more positive psychological outcomes for officers, families, and community members. I can, and I wanna, I wanna bounce off a couple of the things that, that you said. I did, a, I did some work in Calgary, in Canada, with some police officers, and I like to go on a ride along before I work with any department just to get a feel, and I recommend that to anybody in the audience to do that, you will learn a, a lot. And uh, they walked in, the two officers walked into a crowd of people and they were sort of, there was kind of raucous and drinking. They were uh, First Nation people, which meant they had brown skin. And they walked in there and I couldn't see them and they did something, I don't know what, and then they walked out and got in the car and we went away. And I said, you know, in the United States, we would have had everybody proned out on the floor and this would have become like, a, a huge felony car stop. And Mike, I said, how could you do that? And they said, because they're not armed the way people in the United States are armed. And that, so that is, is, is a really big problem here. <clears throat> All right, now my husband tells me I do not put my directional signals on when I change subjects. So I'm now changing <laughs> subjects, okay? <laughs> Follow the bouncing ball, please. Okay. I'll try to weave it together. For you. Come on. <laughs> So we talk about cortisol. I mean, the, the kind of cops that wind up seeing somebody like me and have some kind of post-traumatic stress injury. So this isn't scientific. That's a sort of select group of people. But we know that probably 87 to 90% of them come from homes that were chaotic, in which there was an absent, alcoholic, narcissistic, or somehow disabled parent, and that they were prematurely parentified in their own family. They grew up in chaos, and they grew up taking care of people, and they think that they chose the job of policing, and we say, no, policing chose you. It is a normal, natural segue. So here we've got folks who are on this hypervigilant cycle with cortisol. When we say cops get addicted to the work, that's what they're addicted to the cortisol, to the, the kind of 
high little high you get off of that where you feel bigger, stronger, faster, you know, and then you go home and you flatline and your spouse says to you, let's go out for dinner and you go because you got the remote in your hand looking at television and you go, you go, I'm too tired. And that's what starts to happen to the families then. There is a great separation. And I can't talk about my work at home, most cops say, as though they were married to children. I mean, why, why can't you talk about your work at home? That you can't build that artificial separation. I mean, there may be things that you say, we have to teach them. It's not just black or white. You tell everything or you tell nothing. You say, maybe I saw something today I hope never to have seen in my entire life. The thing that gets the cops the most is anything involving injury or death of a child. Probably the number one stressful incident. But you can't go home and you can go home and say, I can't talk. I don't want to talk about the details. And probably your family is looking at your face. They want to know, did you have that face when you walked in the door because you're mad at me or did you have a bad day at work? And many of them can't articulate feelings. That's what you were saying earlier, that you've got to be able to be responsible for your own mental health. Don't wait for your department to hire somebody like me. It isn't going to happen in most places. Be responsible, like you would go to the dentist and get your teeth fixed once a year or checked. So that's a lot of stuff, and it feels like it wasn't all tied together. Yeah, I, I want to try. I want to try to weave it together. I come to you here just because I, I think I saw something fascinating, and I think it happens a lot, especially in these conversations. So what I heard Dr. Michelle Taylor say about the cortisone was how young black people who are experiencing trauma from the, you know, parade of violence heaped amongst heaped up on black bodies is cortisone levels are through the roof. When Dr. Kirschman talks about cortisone levels, you're talking about the cortisone levels of the police officers, yeah. right? And so that like shifts the conversation away from, based upon how, how our society is structured, the institution and the organization that has the power and authority and takes it further away from the people who we should be trying to center insofar as whatever our public policies and practices are. What I was thinking was, what kind of into institution causes their employees to experience this and how can we try to say that that's okay it's clearly something wrong with it. and if that's the case then i think we have to acknowledge it and i'm wondering like what can be done to redress it eric i think you were scratching to something i don't know if it's about what i tried to tie together or something else that you know is on the table but but the yeah. floor is yours brother thank you I think the undercurrent to the science piece is the reality that we're dealing with a white supremacist institution. And we could, the science is meaningful and real, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with an institution that has already envisioned you and has built you into the target. You are the target. We are the target. But is that everybody? Because I want you to specify. I agree with you. I just want you to clarify. Melanated we, people. Yeah, OK. All right. All right. All of, the, the, all of us. Say black folks. In Memphis, yeah. say black folks. Okay. I'm all there right. with you. I also struggle with the ride along concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, spin the block. Walk through with the, the people who are, are in the community. And then you'll start to get to all of the institutional, societal, community, individual levels that have an impact on people's lives. And when you get through all of those levels, you can really see how this is a, a compounding energy, a compounding effort that is, is not unintentional. This is a design. And if we're not going to you know, articulate that this is the, the institutions are doing exactly what they were designed to do. And we're, we're lessening our ability to reimagine, yeah. to rebuild. Yeah. 
So I want to come to yeah. Dr. Janet Taylor then to Chief Russell. I just want to make the point. Police officers are not the only ones with stressful jobs. Right. You so talk who, about the 70 percent of essential workers who are mostly black and brown who, <laughs> and women who didn't have the opportunity to work remotely and had to go into work every day and died at higher rates of COVID. Teachers have stressful jobs. You know, doctors have stressful jobs. I mean, stress is inherent. Like stress is gone right. just through the roof for everyone who works, basically. But it's not only police officers. But I think the difference is the inherent power that they have. That's There's right. no question it's a white supremacist culture. But as we know, it's not only white cops who are killing black people. That's right. It's black cops, too. And blacks act out white supremacy culture. Right. Put right. That and right that's, on that's, the there's no question, right? And so how you, I mean, you look at, there have been more black and brown people killed since post-George Floyd by the police, more, as many or more, which, so when we talk about reform, we talk about, and I don't know the answer to this, how do we, how do we destroy this white supremacist culture, which is, I think, what we're really talking about. And you could have a panel every day of the year for that, right? <laughs> But, I, but there is, there's something about getting back to our humanity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's necessarily utopian, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's a reality that we have to look at if we're going to connect in different ways. Because one of the ways to break bias is just to look at somebody and ask how they're doing. Just connecting by one line, one sentence, can break the bias. So we need to... We need to figure out some other ways, which is why, again, all like police, in my opinion, police officers don't need guns in schools. They don't need to be in schools. So they don't, but, right? So there are things that there are, there are opportunities to, 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 to decrease, to increase the disconnect between officers and their guns in our daily lives. I, I, so I think, again, I'm coming to you, Chief Russell. I think, again, that addresses the broader social and political realities. Because now you're talking about, you know, if you're going to take the weapons away from the officers. I'm not averse to it. I just want to be clear. Let me show my hand. I'm not averse to it. But I'm also not under the impression or the illusion that if you take the, the, the weapons out of their hands, that there aren't people out there that still have them. So that means, again, to I think Dr. Uh, Michelle Taylor's point, you got to find a way to remedy this on a larger communal scale and not simply just say, here's the answer based upon this particular target demographic who many of us believe have just far too much uh, authority and, and autonomy and not enough accountability. So here's what I think I'm hearing, Chief Russell. If we circle back to where we kind of started, there seems to be a general consensus that it doesn't matter who you put into the positions, that the institution itself is flawed and fractured. And you don't seem to be buying that. No, I, listen. Go ahead. I love my panelists. Um, they're all more intelligent than I am. But I recognize I'm the only one up here who has lived in that culture, been a part of that culture. So I want to speak to restoration, which do I believe, and I love my brother, um, Eric, we're going to do some work together. I believe restoration through reformation, reformation. I really believe that. So here's the thing. And I'm not talking out of the side of my neck. I'm talking what I know and what has been proven. Because when they had mistakenly given me command of one ninth of the city of Baltimore, one district, the worst district, the most violent district, the most, and you know what I'm talking about, Doc, the most uh, 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 health care challenge district in all of Baltimore, and put me in there, 95 plus percent African American, the police officers there, 130 cops, was about evenly divided, half black, half white. When I took it over, there was visceral hatred towards those cops from the community. The community didn't like the police. The police didn't like the community. I spied on them before I actually put in some things in place. And I will watch my police officers drive through the community, cursing out my black community members, especially the young ones, on their PA systems instead of getting out of their cars. We know police don't like to get out of their cars, saying, get off the corners, you little ninjas. I'm being polite. Mm -hmm. So I watched it, and I sat back, and I studied it and analyzed it. And I said, something's got to break. So then I realized... I've got to change the culture because be mindful, 20 years prior to that, I was in that district as a sergeant and a lieutenant. I disappeared in the world of undercover narcotics. So I didn't see what was going on at a level with community policing. I grew up in community policing. When I came back, it was no more. Young people hated us. Young people didn't even know me, saw me in uniform and cursed me out. And I was baffled. 
And I said, I've got to change this culture. One leader changed the culture in this district. And I put things in place. I collaborated because I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So I collaborated with John Hopkins Hospital. I collabor collaborated with Department of Mental Health. I collaborated with the churches. I collaborated with anything that moved from the businesses to anything that moved the school, the education system, said, this can't be just my problem to fix. It is all of our problems. Chief Russell. Wait, oh, please, Pastor, I got to get this up. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm okay. Gonna, and, go so, ahead. and so what I did is, because I heard Eric said, I can't believe riding along does anything. I then began to put pastors in the car with my worst cops. I had rednecks in my police department. Rednecks who came from the hills of West Virginia, never seen black people until they got hired by Baltimore Police Department. I put them in the car with these people because I read a book a long time ago, 21 Days Will Make a Habit. And I kept them in the car and kept them in the car. And little, little by little, and because I led by example, I can't go through everything. Little by little, my officers began to change and transform and begin to treat the community properly. The community, I begged them, come in and feed my officers every month. Sit down with them, edify them. We can't stand your police. Why would we do that? Because you can help me make them better cops. And I can't go through everything we did, but I will tell you this as a final thing. Within six months, my police district became the best district in the entire city. We went to a 40-year crime low and came into a love fest. Black, white communities, everybody loving on each other, love fest. And it stayed that way until I left four and a half years later. So, the lowest so, crime. So, so, so it was it get, reformed. Well, maybe. Oh, there ain't no maybe. I no, got I'm proof. Not, I got it. And, and, here's why, and here's why I say that. Here's why I say that, right? Um, shouldn't reform last past the reformer? It, sh it should because, listen. But, but so, so hold on. Okay. Hold on. All so, right. so, so a couple right. of things, just in, in the two minutes that we have before we start doing some Q&A stuff. One is, there are exceptions to the rule. Okay. So, so let's just say okay. I affirmed everything you just said about what you were able to accomplish mm -hmm. in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Kudos. Salute. Ashe. The question would become, so that's one department, and then Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. You were, you know, you were prominent mm -hmm. in some of those exchanges, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I mean, there, there are ways to look at this and say there are anomalies, there are unicorns, there are things that happen, but that shouldn't be the standard. Like that, 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 that to me is an unrealistic expectation. I think what I'm hearing the panelists say more collectively is that there has to be some comprehensive approach that revitalizes the understanding of public safety beyond what we have. Dr. Kirschman has already said, basically the toxicity of the job does harm not just to the people who are being policed, but to the officers themselves. I'm not throwing any shade at the wonderful things that you've been able to do, but how many Chief Russells are there? And, and how many- There's one that could be more. That's, yeah, and you can throw and I'm a, tell you how. Yes, and you can throw a starfish back into the seashore, mm -hmm. right. and there are thousands of them. But at some point, you need to do something about climate change because the winds are too high. Let me speak the to waves, you. there's too many, there, there's too many of them, right? And, and so I just this is what I was thinking, Dr. Taylor, when Please I said something. I, I will in my 30 seconds <laughs> or, or 15. And let me digress because I forgot I was a moderator. <laughs> so 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 this is what I was talking about when I mentioned utopia. It is the idea that these, you know, isolated or independent occurrences that we might find some hope and some joy and some promise in, they are exceptions and not the rule. So when Stokely said, to your point, Eric, he said, they said, was he scared to go to jail? And he said, I'm a black man in America. I was born in jail. Like, if, if that's the landscape, I think we have to do something different insofar as a more collective and comprehensive approach. I'll give you in, in, in the rest I'll, of the panelists. So, so, so what I was doing was never supported. Matter of fact, it was... That's not that ironic. Was, no, here's either. what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm telling you. I wasn't supported by the bosses. Mm -hmm. They mocked and laughed at it, even though the results were there, right? Mm -hmm. And so when it came time and I got to that level where if I could take this, if I could do this in one of nine districts and the mayor saw that, you can do that at a high level. So when I got enough rank to take over the department, the system that Eric talks about, that everybody's talking about, right, that white racist system and even us buying into it or becoming a part of it, it kicked me out of the system. What do they say about Malcolm X? And what do they say about somebody in my city said, that's too much power for a black man. That's too much influence for a black man. So, so a top cop in my city said, your, your success and your popularity is both your curse and your blessing. But here's what Joe Biden said back in March. And it's the last thing I'll say. He said, I have given $2 billion to law enforcement in the United States of America to do three things, to retrain their officers, right, 
to hire new officers and to institute community policing. And he came out of his mouth and says, almost nobody is doing it. Well, where's the money going? Because it's being reallocated, siphoned off, stolen. Because I believe, last thing, DOJ has the power to be that entity. Because every police department, 18,000 is depart in this city, every police department is funded federally. Yes. So if DOJ says, unless you implement training, unless you implement training, like, like human, Humankind Alliance, that's a phenomenal training. Unless you implement right. training, like love, uh, love is the answer. Walking Wild Black by a great friend of mine. Uh -huh. Unless you implement training like this, you will not get these funds. Yes. Because we know you're taking these funds, and we don't have the accountability for Will to fight against you and see where you're taking the funds. So right. we know you're stealing it. It can be done, but the All will right. and the desire is not there. So, okay. We have some um, <laughs> questions that have been submitted from audience members, and I'm still watching the YouTube chat. I'm trying to weave some of these together. And I'm going to put them out there. We got about 15, 20 minutes collectively. So whoever feels compelled to try to chime in, please do. Um, the first one, I think, building upon what Chief Russell was saying is this notion about training. Um, one audience member asked, how do you retrain people that have been taught through generations that black lives don't really matter? This is to your point, Eric. And others might ask, well, why doesn't training seem to fail when you're policing white people? Like it seems to fail when you police in black people, if it's a training issue. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to toss that out. Um, hold <laughs> Chief Russell, <laughs> just, just to give some no, of our other panelists, the both of us, Chief Russell, try to give some of our other panelists an yes, opportunity yes, yes. to respond to some of it. Is, is it. is it a training issue or what does training mean? And how do we look at training as potentially one of the pathways into restoration, revolution? I mean, I'll just say training about bias doesn't work. When you talk to white people about white supremacy and bias, it makes them more defensive yeah. and they lose the message. Yeah. Period. Yep. Period. That's right. Doesn't work. That's right. One of the things that um, had my abiding interest always is field training. When you take this new new hire and, and acculturate them to your particular organization. And it is not based on science, it is not based on behavioral science at all. And it is, it is where it's, it's one of the reasons why when somebody takes a pre-employment psychological to get to be a cop, they say at the bottom of the report, this is good for one year only because it's not the same person. Even by the end of the academy, they've lost essential parts of themselves that they had. And that's what they have, that's what they have to find if they're not going to let the job destroy them. So uh, training is very important, but it isn't, it isn't based on anything that I, it, it has no Velcro. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. You can't train someone to view you as a human. You can't train that. And that's what we're missing here. You could, you could do field, I, I don't know, police jargon, tactical training, those types of things. You know, what's the process and procedure during an interaction? But if I'm, if I'm not seen as a human, if I don't have the dignity, you, can, you can't train that. So at the end of the day, that interaction is always going to be adverse and negative for people of color. You can't train that. Can you implement, and you could, you could comment, um, Dr. Taylor, you got anything you want to add to that? A little bit, but I, I want to hear what. And let me just pitch it this way. I can say, what kind of policies you know, as, as the Memphis Police Department is under the pattern and practice investigation right now, yep. what kind of policies should be implemented? Because Stokely also said it's not my responsibility to convert the soul of a racist thug. Right. I'll simply settle for a change in his behavior. Right. Like that comes through policy. So what kind of policies should be implemented? Well, first of all, understand that training is all outdated. I don't know about every, all 18,000, but most of them are so outdated. They're still teaching stuff from when I went through the academy in 1981. So it's, not, it's irrelevant today, right? And so, like Doc was saying, Dr. Kirsch, we got, to, we got to bring our training up to date. Up to date with what's happening today. And I do think people can change. Listen, I change. I was a heathen and everything else, but thank God somebody didn't give up on me and I changed. Well, no, let me say this, let me say this. And so I put things at my low level, right? I knew my offices were broken, traumatized, depressed, Everything else, so I loved on them. Love is the answer to everything. I'm just telling you this right now. And so I loved on them enough that even my most hated 
white officer that didn't like black people, three years later after my command, came to me with tears in his eyes and said, I am so sorry it took me this long to change. And everybody under my command, all 130, but three, I kicked them out, all 130 changed that were a lot of hate in their heart because I began to love on them beyond even their eight hours belonging to me. I love them, the whole man, the whole woman, their families, their children. So everybody can change. Now, I'm, I'm not, saying that because I work from the inside out. Now, y'all might not believe that. I don't I'm think it's about what it. So, Dr. Taylor, I'm coming to you. Uh, I don't think it's about whether or not we believe it. It's about whether or not we should bank black lives on it. And I don't think we should bank black lives on the potentiality of somebody changing. That's usually not how you do social and public policy. I'm That's just my black lives, lives deaths went down. That's all I'm saying. I understand. So social and public policy is difficult, but cultural change is near to impossible. So I thought about this on the way here when we did our tour. And to me, cultural change is, is kind of these two different perspectives. I don't know about any place else, but in Memphis, it seems like everybody is in a hurry, except like two people on the road who, drive, who are just driving as slow as possible. And I always seem to get behind the person who is driving the slowest <laughs> when I'm about to be late, right? And so that culture is, don't you know I have some place to be? Well, actually, they don't know I have some place to be, right? And so I feel like a lot of police officers, you can tell them about implicit bias. You can tell them about these things. But they're like, I don't know that you have some place to be, and I don't know anything about you behind me. I'm doing my thing. This is my culture, right? As opposed to a culture that we used to have where folks knew how to slow down if there was a funeral procession coming Or a through. speed limit. Or, a, or do the speed limit, right? But a funeral procession, just yes, go yes, with me I on guess. this, right? So it used to be, at least my grandparents talked about, if there was a funeral procession coming through, mm -hmm. every car stopped. It didn't matter what race you were or ethnicity. Every car stopped. Men took off their hats. Everybody stopped and let the procession come through, right? That's the difference that we need in perspective. Now, I'm going to do kind of like my esteemed colleague and just change total directions, mm -hmm. right? And talk about policies, determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So I can't really talk a lot about police training because I haven't lived in that world, right? But I can talk about policy determinants of health. Mm -hmm. I can talk about the fact that we live in a state that is not a Medicaid expansion state. You're like, I didn't come to a health talk. Why is no, she saying something been... about Medicaid, right? Well, whether they're police officers or Joe Blow on the street, we have a lot of people walking around in Shelby County who are uninsured because they don't qualify for Medicaid here in the state of Tennessee, but if they lived anywhere else, they would. So if you needed to tap into what the other Dr. Taylor is talking about, mental health services, you can't. You can't get those sessions that you would get if you had insurance. And that's people who are working two or three jobs that may be underinsured or uninsured, right? So there's that. Then we live in a state well, we have permitless gun carry. Hello. So we're talking about, you know, could we have law enforcement that doesn't have guns? Heck no, because everybody's walking around with guns. Everybody. And then finally, we're living in a place, and I hate to bring this up again, but I don't because we're here, right? We're living in a place where the history of law enforcement and the history of black people is such that if we don't start to recognize that and recognize that it informs everything that we're doing now, then we're just still at the beginning, right? We're still at the beginning. We're still, I know we're still at the beginning because I live in a place, safe neighborhood. I have a 17 year old son, okay? And he's a black son <laughs> and I have a daughter. She's younger, but I have a 17 year old son and he's over six feet. And we live in a community that's gated on the back. And about six months ago, we had some black teenagers jump the fence in the back 
and they were running back and forth at two, three o'clock in the morning. And of course, everybody's got cameras back there, so they're sending it through the email chain, right? So now, if I want to send my son out to walk the dog at the dog park at the end of our subdivision, I'm looking outside to make sure that it's not dark when he does it. Mm. Now, would I be doing that if I was any of the white parents in the subdivision? Probably not. But I'm worried because I know we have some new neighbors. And they may mistake my child for one of those young men who decided to jump the fence six months ago. And they may call the police. And my son knows what he is supposed to do, but we have too many examples of young men doing exactly what they were supposed to do, mm -hmm. or even if they're not. Right. I don't mean they deserve They to don't die. deserve to have court in the streets. Yep. You don't deserve it. So, so thank you, thank you. Just according to this, eight minutes left, but I think I'm getting some of the you know, ease up. Three minutes, okay, three minutes left. <laughs> So I, I think here would be a good place for us to conclude. I kind of want to pitch this to the mental health professionals amongst us, because I think one thing that all of us can agree upon is the trauma is pervasive. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm trying to push a concrete policy oriented solution here, can we require therapy for officers once a month, I made this proposal here in Memphis, you know, fell on deaf ears, but, you know, and maybe everybody can speak to this and do your closing comments, everybody in a minute or less, you know. So can we, how do you feel about required therapy once per month for every officer? There are actually funds, there's the law enforcement, what's the LEAP program, law enforcement, something program in South Carolina. Assistance. Assistance yeah. program that actually started a, um, the, the, the state agreed to be taxed, the citizens in the state agreed to be taxed so that there would be a fund available to pay for mental health services once per month. And I argue if you fire your service weapon, it should be increased to more than once a month, things of that nature. So are there policies that we can implement uh, along those lines? Uh, I think once a month is too often. Um, what, uh, what has been successful thus far is once a year, mandatory chief on down. And the other side of that, though, is we've got to have culturally competent clinicians who understand what cops do and why they do it, who understand that when you're talking to a cop, you've got to be a lot more transparent than you were, the way we were trained when we when we in counseling, where you don't answer any questions and you've got the neutral screen face. doesn't work with cops. You got to be able to listen to hard stories. You got to be able to laugh. You got to be able to be very directive. So we don't have enough of those people. I'm part of a group of uh, senior psychologists who are mentoring um, early career psychologists of color who want to work with the police. And I'm sad to say that most of them want to do pre employment screening because that's where the money is, not the kind of interventions that we are talking about here, where you intervene perhaps with an organization or you are working on the mental health of the officer and their families? I, I would say, I think all of us need therapy, right? Because <laughs> yeah. no, every, I mean, every single one of us has had some sort of trauma in our lives, yeah. right? And, but I think for police officers, I think it's more restorative justice that needs to happen weekly and, or monthly or however often that because you really, I mean, only a police, op, I mean, a court can mandate therapy for anyone, but that looks at the harms that are done on both sides in a way that is ongoing and builds community. Much, and that's why, I mean, I really think that what you did, Chief Russell, was, could be replicated in many ways because it brings in all the multi determinants, the pastor, the familiarity, the love, all of those factors, which are things that could happen if there's restorative justice. And, and that, that doesn't, because sometimes with therapy, when you mandate therapy, it's still, you make the other person feel like they're wrong. But the reality is if we're gonna solve this, we're all in this together. So I think a restorative justice approach would be one that I would encourage. Uh, if, 10, se if, 10 seconds, Eric, 10 seconds. So I would say advocate for policies that 
reduce the footprint of police. And we know that when we do things further upstream, there's no need to have police downstream because we're not seeing the same outcomes. So advocate for policies where you don't need police in schools. Advocate for policies where you don't need police responding to a mental health crisis. That's right. Advocate for policies where you don't need a badge and a gun when someone could have been given a car ticket and all you needed was a pen and a pad to give them that ticket. So policies that right now act as alternatives to law enforcement, that's what we should be advocating for collectively. Also look at budgets. The budget doesn't lie. And you have police, law enforcement agencies, police departments always leading the city's budget in terms of funding. And we already know that if we invested in the schools, if we invested in communities of care, if we invested in the community centers, street outreach workers, crisis mobilization units, all of these things, we would not have this over-reliance on a harmful institution. All right, we got so much more we want to talk about. Y'all give it up for the panel, and let's welcome back President Russ Wiggins. I'm sorry to be the bad guy to in this amazing conversation, but um, I want to remind everybody that we're at the National Civil Rights Museum. And when you came in tonight, my guess is you walked up the courtyard and your head automatically turned to the right and you looked up at room 306 and you looked where that wreath is and you're reminded of the power of that leader who was assassinated there 60 years ago or 55 years ago. And you thought about this sacred space as a place where conversations like this, these passionate, powerful, and provocative people would come and share perspective to all of us about what's happening in Memphis, in Tennessee, in our country, and in some other parts of our world that need to be resolved. So first thing I want to do is thank our panelists for what they contributed to this conversation. I would ask all of our uh, people in our audience and online to complete the event survey and to join us in the conversation and the reception uh, if you're here and to continue this sort of dialogue that we had tonight. I also want to make sure to uh, acknowledge, I noticed that uh, our, our, our Wells family came in, and I'm saying our Wells family came in because we are in community with them. They are our people, and we love them here at the National Civil Rights Museum. Thank you. We are grateful for our Catalyst partners who helped make this phenomenal conversation happen, FedEx, Cummings, and the Kresge Foundation. I challenge you to help us deliver more programming like this by making a gift, showing support, being engaged, being in attendance, all of the things to help us continue to do the work that we do. You can visit us at www.civilrightsmuseum.org. You can also scan the QR code on the screen. Thank you for all you do to make sure that the National Civil Rights Museum honors the legacy of Dr. King and, and make sure that dignity and civil, civil and human rights is at the core of what we do because part of what I heard and this entire brilliant body is if we don't love, if we don't respect, and if we don't treat everybody with dignity, it's going to be hard to generate any kind of formula to help us get where we need to go. But this panel helped us head in that right direction, and we salute them. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.